Welcome to another episode of The Open Road. This is a conversation between friends about our experience and thoughts around open source software. And we bring in a bunch of people who know more than we do to talk about their experience and thoughts around open source. My name is Rich Bowen, and I work in the open source program office at Red Hat. And my name is Brian Prophet, also with the Red Hat open source program office. And it is admittedly not a high bar to find people who know more than we do. So um, we, we, as we move into the, this next uh, session of episodes that are coming up, we've moved beyond the, the question of onboarding. And now we're going to be talking around uh, foundations, which are an integral part of free and open source software. Um, you know, in the olden times, uh, you know, foundations were a rare breed, but now you pretty much can't throw a stick anywhere and not hit some sort of foundation. And that is not really said to be, um, you know, uh, as, a, as a bad thing. Um, foundations have their uses. They are extremely helpful for free and open source software projects. And, and that's sort of what we're going to be exploring um, in this next series of episodes on the open road. Um, and so to start off, we wanted to um, ask the question of our guests, um, like basically, if you're a software project for your open source, what is the tipping point for you? When, when should you start really examining whether or not you need a, uh, a, to join a software foundation? Um, and so the first person that we posed this question to was, was I'm sorry, Shane Kukuru, who is the vice chairman of the Apache Software Foundation. So we figured, you know, he might know uh, a thing or two about that question. So here's what Shane had to say. Um, well, obviously it depends on your project. The most important thing is understand what your goals are and then understand what the foundations give. But, um, and the answer would be different from 1999 to today, <laughs> very different. But the way to think about it is really about your community. Who is actively helping move your project along? So a key thing is when you wanna expand your contributor base, right? If you, if you wanna get more people submitting serious patches, you wanna get more people, you know, helping you do testing, finding new uh, places the product can go into, and then maybe helping do that. That's something a foundation can both give you the community mentoring to help encourage, as well as the sort of branding and governance chops. So a lot of projects, you know, think they're great, but if you're off on your own, or if you're working, you know, if, if you're seen as working for a single company, there are a lot of people in open source who will be like, great, that's fine, that's a nice company project, but it's not really open source yet. And coming to a foundation is the place that will give you the chops, give you the, the respect for the chance for having independent governance. Um, so the corollary to that also for, for independent projects is you come to a foundation when you feel you really need some protection from corporations. Right? If you want your project to grow up by itself and not get bought out by somebody, um, then a foundation is a place that can do that. They can give you the assistance to make sure your governance will scale. And of course, uh, scaling is, is, you know, the real question in whatever aspect, whatever axis we're talking about scaling. But really, the time to come to a foundation is when you understand you need your governance to grow for the project. And to do that, you need to draw in new people who can not only contribute to the project, but who can become leaders of the project and help help you go to the next step, whatever that might be. And that's the reason to come to foundations. When you see you have that, there are a bunch of foundations here who are here to do exactly that for you. So Shane covers a lot of the, the high level things that a foundation offers, uh, governance, community building, mentoring, branding. Um, and you know, I have a bit of an inside scoop on Shane, having worked with him at Apache for many years. And, and one of the things that he was always emphasizing as a director was providing services that a project is not interested in providing for themselves. And he kind of, he kind of uh, focuses on that in his response mm -hmm. here. Yeah, he does. And, and, and what was interesting to me, because um, he 
he definitely hit the highlights of the standard answers that I've heard a lot of people saying. And um, like, if you need to get your contributor base up, or if you need more people to help you with testing, or if you need more marketing, you know, get your, get your project um, out to uh, avenues that it might not have been at before the, you know, we've heard that before. The thing that really jumped at me and was this notion of wanting to scale your governance, mm -hmm. um, which when he said it made perfect sense, but that's not something I've heard phrased that way before, because usually you don't think of governance as scaling. You just think of governance as here's a set of rules and yeah, we'll tack on more rules as we go on. But not a lot of people give thought, or at least I don't about scaling governance. Um, and I would think that your experience in the Apache Foundation might, you know, like allude to that a little bit more. Yeah. And, and scaling, scaling is always challenging because as you, as you grow, your culture sometimes doesn't keep up and, uh, having a clear expectation of, of governance, um, it is, it, it does kind of help you grow as a community when when you understand um, how things are structured and who's responsible for what. Um, a, a lot of smaller projects don't feel like they need any governance, and and that that may be one of these tipping points is where you your community you suddenly realize that your community is large enough that you actually need some rules, and that's a that's a hard step for some smaller projects to take. It is, and 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 there's also this like inherent bias against like having a lot of rules and having a lot yeah. of bureaucracy. Even I, like, uh, I know I drive my colleagues at Red Hat a little bit nuts uh, okay. for lots of reasons, but for this particular reason, it's, I usually am very uh, lackadaisical about governance. I usually say to new communities, look, we're not asking for a bunch of formal bylaws or a constitution. We're basically just saying governance is where if there is a problem, to whom do you go and you know get that problem decided? Um, and it's certainly not minimizing the importance of governance, but I also you know don't believe that it has to be super formal. I think the exception to that will be things like codes of conduct, um, which I think are super important to have for every community um, because conflict needs to be resolved fairly and equitably. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm not a big, big believer in that. So again, the notion of governance that needs to scale um, is something I definitely need to chew on. Another thing that he said at the very beginning of his response is something that I think we'll be hearing a lot of, and that is that it's important for a project to know what it's looking for. And to, to quote Joe Jackson, you can't get what you want till you know what you want, and uh, <laughs> you know if if you're a if you're a project that's shopping around for a foundation, if you don't know what you're looking for, then you're guaranteed not to find it. And so that sort of that sort of introspection has to happen at the project level, where they where they're the ones that are saying what that tipping point is, what that thing is that they can't do for themselves that they need someone to do for them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's true. And 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 uh, I hopefully this conversation will help people kind of get a better feel for what they need. Um, so we we've talked to some other people, obviously, w when we ask this question. Um, I think we should probably, you know, look at the responses of somebody who's currently outside the the foundational structure a little bit. So we talked to VM Brasur, who is a, a corporate strategist um, who very much focuses on free and open source software. Uh, Vicky, to her friends, which we are fortunate enough to be, um, ha has some really great ideas um, about how foundations should work. Um, she's been work she's worked with a number of corporations and as such, you know, has dealt a lot with uh, foundations over the years. So we put the same question to Vicki and here's what she had to say. It, 
I mean, it really does depend. Um, I'm glad that this is one of the questions I did copy down and, and think about in advance. Um, plus, I've done a lot of consulting, so pretty much everything I answer is going to be, it depends. But in this case, it really does, um, because it depends a lot upon the project's needs and the founders of the project's needs. Um, for instance, if it's from a corporation, if it's a corporation that's created a new project and it's looking to release it, and it specifically is actively, very actively seeking external contributors, mm -hmm. it can be incredibly beneficial to place that project in an independent home um, where they can, very, they can point and say, look, we want your help. We created this thing. We want your help. And we are not controlling it. We are just contributing to it. Mm -hmm. And that really adds a lot of validity to their seriousness about collaborating. So that can be very helpful to place it in a foundation in that way. But if it's a community oriented or originating sort of project, mm -hmm. right? Something that people built out in the community, say like the Godot gaming engine came out of the community. Um, does it make sense for them to have a foundation? I, I don't know, at a certain point for some projects, it does make sense for them to get some sort of another level of oversight and administrative help. Is that a foundation? Maybe, like Blender. Blender created the Blender Foundation and it made sense for them because they had a massive amount of adoption and a lot of corporations that wanted to sponsor and things like that. But then there are other projects that, you know, they just, they don't need that level mm -hmm. of oversight. Um, they might not need a foundation at all. What they might need is just an independent home they might need somebody just to hold the money. They might need somebody to help with legal support. They might need, they might need. Mm -hmm. um, one thing they might not need is the overhead of forming a nonprofit sure. organization. And most projects, they don't need that. So clearly Vicki and I are going to get along famously throughout this <laughs> conversation because she, she hits, I am certainly not anti-foundation. But she hit some of the notes that um, always resonate with me in terms of, do we need the extra oversight? Do we need the extra layer of bureaucracy, so to speak? And, and I think that's, you know, I'm representing a, a, a segment of the free and open source software community that tends to be, not politically, but tends to be philosophically libertarian, which is basically, you know, I want to we want to do what we want to do and we don't want a lot of rules to do it. We want to have the freedom to create and build and do this thing um, within obvious reasons and societal norms. But, you know, so I, I think her comments echo that. I, I'm not sure that's what she was trying to get along or get across, but it definitely, that's the way it felt to me. Like be more mindful about what it is you need because here be dragons and they have a lot of red tape. Yeah, and there can be a lot of, of overhead and, and bureaucracy with a foundation. Um, and I think that some of us have our opinions shaped by scars from the past. You know, I've, I've been involved with or around more than one project that didn't feel they needed a foundation, but they wanted somebody to hold the money. And then the person that held the money didn't have their best interests at heart to uh, to skip a few details. And so I, I think that this too is a, a question of, of growth and scaling. There, there's gonna come a time, hopefully, in a successful project where you're no longer best friends with everybody that's working on it. And and perhaps that will be that that point at which you you do need somebody to hold the money. But but I think that it's true that the vast majority of projects uh, are never going to need a foundation. And mm -hmm. and so it, once again, she focuses on this uh, understanding your needs, understanding what you want to do for yourself and what you'd rather outsource. And then figuring out the, I guess, the, the minimum viable whatever it is that fills that need. Yeah, definitely. So definitely not a one size fits all approach. Um, the other thing she said, um, and 
which is com almost completely opposite of what I just was talking about is I, I did appreciate, you know, she gave the, the point of view from the corporation mm -hmm. too, yeah. that the corporation is just as much of a player in this as the individual contributor because they join foundations for different reasons too. Um, the one she highlighted is certainly a big one, which is finding external uh, contributors. Um, I, I, I don't think people outside the free and open source software world have a sense of just how desirable that is for, for corporations who are trying to be, you know, uh, best players in uh, the free and open source software ecosystem, like Red Hat, um, you know, when I tell the story about how, you know, at Red Hat, we are always looking for organizational diversity in our projects. I mean, we're looking for all diversity, but organizational diversity in this case is, you know, we want other corporations, we want independent contributors, we want everybody to have a seat at the table because our firm belief is the more talent you have and the more insights you have from different directions, the better the overall project will be. And it is hard. It is hard. Um, and and it, part of it is to is that the corporation itself there's a there's a there's a a perception that the corporation really doesn't want that. Like people will, and I've heard this conversation a million times. And I'm not picking on just my employer. I'm sure people um, at Sousa and Canonical get this too, where they'll. You know, they'll basically say, why, sh why should I, a contributor, come to your project when you basically run the thing mm -hmm. um, and you're not going to really accept changes that don't fit your model of where you think the project is going to be? And, and, and in many, many cases, I can't speak for the other companies, but in many cases at Red Hat, that is just simply not true. Um, we definitely have a model. We know where things are going to go, but we also recognize there are other voices and other talents that could come in and convince us of a better way of doing things. Um, and that's certainly one reason why, you know, we as a company um, tend to join foundations yeah. um, because we are trying to get over that hurdle of non-neutrality, so to speak. Yeah, and it can be very, very challenging to in the best of times to attract new contributors to a project, but uh, but having that having that credibility of being in an organization that's known for being vendor neutral can really in in it can really lower the bar uh, the the uh, the resistance that people have that you're describing it can really lower that if they're if they're at a place like eclipse or like the linux foundation or apache that's known to be uh to, to be vendor neutral and and you know that you're contributing to the commons not just to the bottom line of a particular corporation mm -hmm. exactly well our final guest today is going to be guy martin who is the executive director of open oasis um, oasis open oasis open now see there you go. This is why <laughs> I need an editor. Um, Oasis Open. Thank you very much. So, um, and 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 his work there. You know, Guy again has been around the the free and open source software community for uh, quite some time, and his work at Oasis Open gives him some insights about how foundations should work and what they should be about. So again, we put the question to him. If you are a project, when do you need a foundation? And his answer is coming up. You know, sometimes people look at it and say size. Okay, how big is this project? But I think you actually have to look beyond size and you have to look for what area is that that particular piece of technology going to impact, right? So, um, and sometimes it's things that have already existed, right? The example that, that comes to mind is Open Distro, right? The Elasticsearch uh, fork that, that our friends at AWS have. And finding, uh, when you have something that is being used to that degree and it's being sort of driven by one or just a couple of organizations, I think the natural thing that you, you see is, okay, if you want the entire industry to coalesce around this, 
it needs to be in a neutral place, right? Oasis, you know, other places. It needs to be in some sort of a, of a neutral place so that um, everybody feels like there's a a place where the governance is well known and where you know the people, the organizations that have, have contributed and who have made an investment in that um, still get to help control the direction, but they're sharing it, right? I think it's really, really challenging sometimes when you have big organizations um, that have started something and feel like they have to maintain control, complete control. It's you know broadening it out, especially in, in these things that are more infrastructure based or things that everyone has to rely on. Finding that place um, to actually have that that neutral collaboration is important. So Guy focuses on not so much the size of the project as the size of you might say the market for that project, the the space where it's being adopted, and um, it it also reflect some of the things that you were just saying about feeling comfortable contributing to a project because it's in a neutral place. But he focused on uh, the feeling of ownership and control. And and uh, so, yeah, it's it's hard to get a, a one company to participate in a project that is owned and controlled by another company because they feel like they're just helping their competitor out. But having a neutral place makes them feel like they own it as well and so it's it's about it's about ownership of that project when it's in a neutral place i think indeed and 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 it kind of gets into and i think guy didn't say it explicitly but it gets into the the concept of sustainability mm -hmm. um, will the project be sustainable if it is not being held by one um one um, you know, a corporation. Um, and I, I remember being a reporter and, and being one of the, one of the, one of the reporters and, and press people who were sort of pushing for this as a, as a columnist about like when OpenStack started and, you know, it was, you know, being held in Rackspace and Rackspace had it, you know, and everybody, everybody and their sister and their brother were pushing to get it out into a foundation. And I was certainly a part of that course. And eventually they did. And I remember, you know, a lot of the reasoning was just the same things that, you know, Guy was saying is that it shouldn't, something this big should not be held by one corporation. Um, and, and, and then they, now we're getting the whole thing about sustainability. Um, mm -hmm when you know when does a project get important enough that the interest in keeping it in a neutral safe space um so that that's kind of funny because all the other questions we you know when we've had this discussion in this episode we've been talking about what does the project want to do but yeah. in this case really the question was almost forced out of Rackspace's hands um, and, and it, the question kind of got away from them because every, all the external pressure to make a foundation was so, I mean, it was prevalent. I mean, everybody was, you know, slapping them around the, uh, to get that foundation started. So that, that in turn, we could probably do a whole other episode on that. Just like. How, how do you deal with that when your project becomes too big to fail? Um, and, and what does that mean as far as the foundation goes? And Guy's perspective, Guy's coming out of a standards organization. Oasis in its roots is a standards organization. And one of the reasons for adopting standards is to make sure everything interoperates, everything works together. But the reason to adopt an open standard is that you're not at the mercy of some organization that can then change the standard, make you non-compliant and push you out of the market. And it, Guy seems to be making a similar argument for open source software in a foundation. Um, if, if you're going to build an industry around something like this, you wanna make sure that there's no one single player that can suddenly rip the rug out from under you and destroy your business model. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, and I, I see this, um, I see this in like uh, organizations like the Linux Foundation, which is 
obviously gotten way beyond Linux. Yeah. Um, when I first worked at the Linux Foundation many, many years ago, there weren't that many people there. There weren't that many projects there. It was very, very focused on Linux. But even mm -hmm. in my time there, it became clear that there were other sectors of the open source technology sector that would benefit from having sort of the umbrella of, of, of a, a trade uh, foundation like the Linux Foundation. Um, and so we, we've seen things. So even smaller projects like open SSL, you know, and it became part of their, the, the foundation's, you know, sustainability project, you know, that, that kind of uh, protection, so to speak, and neutrality became, uh, certainly prevalent. And again, that's another aspect of sustainability. So it, it, it kind of comes full circle. It's like the foundations themselves. I, I don't want to use it because it's trite, but even they have become too big to fail. They've become a safe, I guess safe harbor would be a better uh, term for them. That they've been around so long that a lot of these foundations, um, and that's not taking anything away from a new foundation, but a lot of the existing ones have really become a safe harbor for projects that need that level of governance, as people have said, neutrality, as people have said. So... Yeah, it's been interesting to watch this change and grow. And I think then we're at the end of our, our interviews. If you are part of an open source project, we'd like to hear from you. What brought you to a foundation or why did you choose not to go to a foundation? These are some of the perspectives that we'd like to hear to kind of expand our viewpoint here because we've been talking to people that are for the most part pro foundation. and. Uh, We'd, we'd love to hear more perspectives. We would indeed. So with that, we're pleased to wrap up this edition of The Open Road. Stay tuned as we continue to explore uh, more questions around the existence and the function of foundations. And so my name is Brian Prophet. And I'm Rich Bowen. And we would all, we wish you a very safe and uh, healthy day. <laughs>